Impressed? Well, Pfizer may not know it, but there are real things that science won't discover. Last week we found three certainties for followers of Jesus in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. God's Word says that God will guide us into maturity. He will use His Word, He will use our circumstances along with many other things, but He will guide us into maturity. Secondly, we discovered that Jesus will be glorified. He will be shown to be the wonder that he really is, unveiled, put on display. Third, we will be with Jesus in that glory. We who believe in Christ will be with him. That was the mission he came on to rescue us and to save us and to put us into God's family by forgiving our sins through his death on the cross. We will be with Jesus in his glory. However things go with viruses, climate change, threatening meteors, economic unrest, political elections. In God's authoritative, inspired words are God's plans, God's character, and oh, by the way, our place in the cosmos. Well, today's passage smacks my wishes for a return to normal upside the head, hard. Let me read to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Well, as you have conversation, as you watch media, what words of comfort are you hearing uh, concerning the future? Well, what are they doing to tell you uh, about not be afraid? Are they saying things like, we're going to get through this. We all need to work together. I'll wear my mask to protect you. You will wear yours to protect me. Soon things will get, yeah, back to normal. Back to normal. Could I ask a nasty question? Um, was the old normal we were at ideal? Would that be good enough? And let me go a step further for you, Jesus followers. Do you think God was pleased with our normal? Our text shook me because Paul was writing to early believers who were going through hard times of persecution for their faith. And they remembered their life before Christ, but they were not going back to that old normal at no time does Paul comfort them about some return to that old normal. They had an active, practical theology of suffering that they were living out because they knew there was a purpose to it. They knew the parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils. The encouragement that Paul holds out to them is not a return to the past. It's a journey into the future. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily unsettled or alarmed. 
He doesn't point him to the past. He points him to the future. Well, let me summarize the implications of today's text in two sentences. And they're pretty close, so if you're taking notes, it should be simple. Our future is amazing, but spiritual deception is already bad. We'll see that in just a minute. Our second point is this. Our future is amazing, but spiritual deception will get much worse. As Paul wrote this section, he apparently either responded to questions the Thessalonians had asked, or maybe problems that Timothy had observed when he visited Thessalonica. Understanding the future was their problem issue. Their hope had been founded on the work of Christ in the past, his death and resurrection, and the promise of Christ's return for believers living and dead. They had precious hope to cling to, remember, encourage one another with these words. But 2 Thess chapter 2 informs us that there has been a persistent, intense, systematic attack on the story of Jesus and its meaning for the first century. Words were tweaked. Messages were edited. Apparently some were forged. And somehow they were trying to merge the Christian faith with the thinking and the philosophies of the day. Our issues today may be heterosexual marriage, gender fluidity, reproductive rights, and end-of-life dignity. Their issues including the impossibility, even the undesirability of physical resurrection. Why would anybody want that? Intellectual sophistication, fitting in with the Greek philosophies of the day, Gnosticism, and coexisting with other religions and gods. So our passage is one of the most challenging in all of Paul's writings because, frankly, there is much we do not know that apparently the Thessalonians did know. There are a whole mess of things in this passage that if you press me on, I will have to say what Augustine said centuries ago regarding Paul's words here. And I quote, I frankly confess, I do not know what he means. Well, what is clear in this passage, however, is that spiritual deception is present and seeks to undermine biblical authority. That one is really clear. The Thessalonians' hope for the future was being undermined by confusing redefinitions and deceptions. Their lives could never go back to the normal they once knew, but they had hoped for an amazing future, Christ seen in all of his wonder, and believers living and deceased gathered together with Christ in his glory, but now someone or something was undermining their hope. Our text today then is about spiritual authority and consequently about spiritual deception. Our future is amazing, but spiritual deception is already bad. We see that in this letter. They had a problem with, I don't know if you've heard of this or not, fake news. A prophecy, a report, a letter supposedly from Paul had been circulating. What they had been taught was in error. Paul apparently had given these believers a thorough orientation when the church was founded. He mentions things they already knew. The new teaching in Thessalonica may have been the same teaching that Timothy encountered over in Ephesus. I read in 1 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, some say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, who have wandered away from the truth. And so the idea of false teaching and deception and undermining the apostolic message was already there in the lifetime of the Apostle Paul. Well, if you flip ahead to 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 17, we're in chapter 2 today, but it's okay, run ahead to chapter 3 for a second. Paul closes the letter this way. What do you make of this? I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Why would he put that there? And this is not the only Pauline letter where we have a similar closing. Well, during my COVID exile on Adams Road, my paranoia can run pretty well unchecked. It occurred to me that 
my personal reality has been reduced to my house, my yard, the internet, my driveway. Oh, occasionally running over to church to check mail or film these videos. So, it struck me, how do I know what's real anymore? Those callers. Was that really Dan and Donna or some voice simulation? After all, Alexa calls me Bob every morning, and I'm pretty sure she is not a real person. I've asked her, and I don't think she'd lie. I'm AI, she says. Well, what I've started doing is asking callers authentication questions, stuff that only the real person would know before I end the phone call. By the way, paranoia can be highly entertaining. So notice what Paul says at the end of his letter. Instead of continuing to dictate his letter as he had previously, and as he closes it, he authenticates it by his own distinctive handwriting. I, Paul, write this in my own hand. This is my distinguishing mark. And so why would you do that? It seems to be a sure sign stuff was being faked to undermine what the Thessalonians and others had been taught. Fake news, not a new problem. Well, notice that Paul says a prophecy, literally a spiritual, a, a spirit-given message, is not necessarily to be believed. Neither is a report, literally a word, or a letter supposedly from us, he writes. They had received their instructions from an apostle there at Thessalonica, one who had seen the risen Christ and was authorized by Jesus to speak and write for him. New teacher said, eh, you can't believe what you've been taught. We have new insight. New is always better, right? Well, Paul used two trouble words for the Thessalonians, unsettled and disturbed. Unsettled was an event that quaked them, but disturbed was one that was continuing on brewing. In fact, it sounds like they were now stewing in skepticism. Well, how else is deception done? Second, redefine words. People think you're talking about the same thing. You don't mean the same thing at all. Does resurrection have to be physical? Or can it mean that, well, Jesus lives on when his teaching is believed and his com commands are obeyed. He's alive in your heart. He's alive in your thoughts. But he's not physically alive. In fact, Jesus returns every time someone trusts him. He lives in them, alive in their thinking and in their lifestyle. Now that's resurrection. Really? The Acts 1 angel said this, the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, but if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. It doesn't sound like some idea living on in the minds and lifestyles of followers of Jesus. No, it sounds like a definitive physical resurrection. Redefining words is one way to deceive, but make no mistake, the Bible teaches a physical return of a physically resurrected from the dead Jesus. Anything less is spiritual deception, no matter how sophisticated it may sound. Omit scriptural teaching. That's a great one. Just edit the Bible down to your favorite text and represent that as the whole teaching of scripture, at least the whole that you need. Paul lists unmistakable precursors of Christ's return in 2 Thess chapter 2. The apostasy or rebellion has to take place. The revealing of the man of lawless has to take place. This man doomed to destruction, the one that the apostle John calls the Antichrist. Paul points out in our text, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? They had been taught by an apostle of Jesus Christ. They must not think for a moment that version 2.0 is just down the road. They receive sure word of God as reliable as if taught by Jesus himself. Jesus, who said, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will not pass away. So to be an apostle of Jesus Christ is to be authorized by the risen Christ 
to speak for Christ. If you were taught by John or Paul or James or Peter or Matthew, would you discount what they told you, especially regarding the resurrection? I mean, they were eyewitnesses. I don't think you are. I'm pretty sure I'm not. I rather imagine you and I would have vivid memories of those teaching times at the foot of an apostle, probably some notes to refer to. Now, our point is really simple. The Old Testament is composed of writings inspired by God through prophets of God or those writing under their authority. The New Testament is made up of writings inspired by God through apostles of Jesus Christ or those writing under their authority. It's as if God himself is teaching through those men and now through that printed page. Reading their teaching is to be taught by them and ultimately because of inspiration to be taught by God himself. Periodically, you can purchase a copy of an ancient letter at a grocery store checkout line. By the way, strange place for an ancient document, don't you think? Or you might see a movie like the Da Vinci Code based on some missing part of the Bible newly discovered that turns up everything you knew about Jesus, turns it upside down. Uh, Jesus had a wife. Uh, they had children. Uh, he died and was buried, and the whole resurrection thing was a big hoax. Oh, undermine your faith? I don't think so if you've been taught by an apostle. If you sat at his feet and written and re read the words that he wrote in the scripture, the same ploys are recycled because the same strategy is in place. Discredit apostolic teaching with new information, and oh, by the way, omit existing in, uh, information that is far, far more valuable. Paul reminds them of previous teaching. Before Christ returns, the rebellion must occur, then the revealing of the man of lawlessness, neither of which had happened. I had told you these things. By the way, imagine the pain the believers in Thessalonica went through. After receiving the message about Jesus with great joy, after turning away from their idols, after being ridiculed and persecuted in their hometown, imagine what it was like to have some really confident new teacher inform them that they had misunderstood the whole return of Christ thing. And oh, by the way, you just missed him. Now imagine the relief they must have felt to hear Paul say that he stands by his teaching and they had it right after all. Christ will return and gather them to himself and out of their current persecutions. But according to our text, there's even more trouble ahead. The future rebellion or apostasy described by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 is also there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power." Look, I won't have an argument. Are we in the last days? Prophetically speaking, absolutely. But Paul tells us that there's an intensity to all that coming that reaches a grand climax that is still future. How do you summarize what he wrote there in 2 Timothy 3? Well, in a word, it's the word we find in 2 Thessalonians 2, lawlessness. Um, let's use a more marketable word, freedom. The seeds of this future rebellion sprout already. 2 Thess 2.7 says, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Jesus guided John to write, Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Are we in the last days? We are. Do the last days get worse as we get closer to the end? They do. So our future is amazing, but spiritual deception will get much worse. Get worse? Aren't things bad enough as it is? It gets worse? 
it gets worse. The man of lawlessness will act like he's God. He makes the rules he's accountable to no one. That sounds, by the way, like a pretty terrible way to run a small planet. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. It's not simply Christianity opposes, it's all religions because he must be the center and the focus of all. By the way, a similar event was due to happen in the lifetime of the Thessalonians. In 40 AD, the Caesar Caligula, also known as Gaius, had decided to proclaim himself God in the Jewish temple. His image was to be set up in the Jewish temple and turn it into a sanctuary for his own cult to come and worship him as the new God manifest. Um, Fortunately, a Syrian official sensing a hot powder keg used stall tactics, probably misfiled the letter. What do you think? Instead of following through, he put them off and didn't follow through, and in AD 41, Gaius was assassinated. But there's still this future man of lawlessness, ready for his appointed time. What else do we find out about him? Our text says that he is a tool of Satan. It sounds so strange to our ears, trained in materialism, to speak about spirit beings as revealed by the Bible. I suppose I could cower, maybe edit this part out for fear of looking like some ignorant Bible-toting rube, but I cannot. You see, the Bible is authoritative, word of God. It reveals this future fact and spiritual reality, and it tells me a whole host of other things I wouldn't know otherwise. So when it comes to this authority of the Bible, if I'm in, I've got to be in all the way on this authority issue. Our passage says, man of lawlessness is a tool of Satan to work the deceptions of Satan. How does he dupe these people who follow him? What does the man of lawlessness do? Well, he does impressive signs and wonders and counterfeit miracles. This is proof beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it's bogus. Truth detectors have been turned off. Our text says they refuse to love the truth. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. The truth really standing in the place of the truth of the gospel about Jesus. They've refused to love the truth. The message about Jesus is disbelieved. And willing disbelief sets people up for satanic deception. All nature hates a vacuum, especially a spiritual one, and we will ultimately worship something. So God further sends them a powerful delusion as an act of judgment on their unbelief. You see, when I begin resisting God's word, I grow progressively more insensitive to his leading. Look, those who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness, they find something else that tweaks their imaginations and their passions. And Jesus warned us that if our eye is bad, our whole body is full of darkness. They delight in wickedness. That's what they want to see. But they don't want the truth to be true. Think for a moment just how quickly our globe has endorsed masks as good manners. The right threat, the right media attention, the right leadership directives, the right message repeated and repeated, and the mass of humanity takes off in a different direction. It seems a trend or a delusion can begin with a puff of wind, a cough, we are not trend or delusion bulletproof, apparently. What does our passage say about how, how all this ends? Two words. Jesus wins. Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Unbelievers will be condemned because they do not believe. They don't believe they need Jesus to save them. Who is the ultimate hero in this future story? Well, many speculate about the identity of the Antichrist. There's a whole list that will fill pages and pages of possible names, all of which have died and gone on to their eternal reward. But it's easy to identify the hero. 
In this great saga, the hero is Jesus. He is the only one here to capture our attention. Love this hero because he makes all things new. Have you settled the issue of authority in your life? Here's what the Bible says. There's a way that seemed right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. It also says the heart is desperately wicked above all else. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the hearts. Well, so much for trusting your intuition or your hunches or your conscience. I'd suggest you get a higher authority. As we close, I want to take us back to where we started. Do you really want your normal life back? What was normal for these at the end of our passage today, these who did not believe? When Jesus defeats them with his spoken word, their normal was disbelief, rebellion, ignoring God and his word, loving wickedness, maybe publicly, maybe privately, maybe both being misled by convincing proofs, knowing they were right when they in fact were wrong. Rejection of God's authority. That was their normal. If that was your pre-COVID normal, don't go back. Maybe your corona break included more praying, more listening to God, more reading his word, more helping others, more great conversations, then don't go back to normal. Go forward.